Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us this morning or this afternoon now. Um, so this morning I tried to get into Webinar Ninja to get us started and um, received an internet uh, 500 error and emailed them and they said, yeah, we did an update and it shouldn't have affected anybody, but of course it has. So I appreciate your patience. Um, we, we managed to get this up last second. And the most important thing, of course, is that you get your CE. So um, that should still happen. I've got all your names as well. I don't registered. know how you, what's going on with the tail. And um, we, will, uh, we will get you your information um, after the CE um program sometime within the next seven days or so you can expect that email from me please make sure that you're muted um i can mute you as well if uh if by some mistake you're not and um if you want to go ahead and um if a question occurs to you feel free to type it in the chat but just know that i'm going to be emailing people this link so that they can get caught up with us. So it may or may not get answered until the end of the program. I don't want Dr. Vicari to have to watch the chat box. So we will um, we'll definitely get your questions answered, but it might not be until the end of the program. Um, okay, so uh, after all that nonsense, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Vicari and I know she's got an awesome program for you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully everyone can hear me and hopefully Dr. Aaron Vicari, I am one of the two. You got to turn off your sound. Okay. Is that working? All right. I'm one of the two dentists. Uh, Dr. Brian and I are here at the Animal Emergency and Referral Center. Um, I spent 15 years in general and emergency practice prior to continuing my education um, in dentistry and I've been doing dentistry strictly for eight years. Um, so I know what it's like to be, Dr. Brian and I both know what it's like to be in the trenches of GP dentistry. Um, so with that said, we're gonna go through um, dental extractions. We're gonna start with some really basic stuff. A lot of talk about instrumentation, um, things that you have, things that might help you out if you don't have them um, and go from there. So, can advance my slides. All right. Um, so this, uh, hopefully everybody's watching on a screen big enough to look at all my photographs, um, photo credits to my amazing dentistry team, uh, Laurel, Heidi, and Allie could not have done this without them. So today we'll go through um, some indications for extractions, review equipment, um, do a very sort of long step-by-step -step on extractions, kind of focusing a lot on flaps and releasing incisions, sectioning teeth, um, elevating and closing, which I think are sometimes um, some of the hardest parts of um, particularly complicated extractions. We'll go through some specific teeth that tend to be difficult extractions. And then lastly, go through some complications and how to avoid them. Uh, Indications for extractions are many. Obviously, periodontal disease is probably the biggest one that we see in general practice. Um, clearly, endodontic disease, so those teeth with those complicated crown fractures where the fracture extends into the pulp canal. Um, so fractured teeth and discolored teeth um, certainly can be extracted. Um, many can also be saved with root canal treatment, so keep that in mind as an option. Uh, tooth resorption, crowded teeth, malocclusions, stomatitis, uh, trauma, often leaves us needing to extract teeth, um, and then neoplasia as well. In terms of equipment, obviously we need our PPE, um, masks, eye protection, and gloves. Lighting and magnification, I can't uh, emphasize those enough. Um, lighting and magnification will make your life so, so much easier. Um, it's also really easy to get um, you know, depending on your eyes, um, but you can get one set of lights and loops that multiple people in the practice, practice can share. Um, this right here is my shameless plug for Anova, which is a local uh, light and loop company. They have very affordable equipment. Um, they're based out of Minneapolis. They have great customer service. There are lots and lots of light and loop companies out there for you to look at, um, but this is just a homegrown local one um, that we've had a really good experience with. We also need radiographs, um, pre and post-op radiographs are standard of care. Um, so don't be caught without those. A water-cooled high-speed handpiece and then local anesthetic agents. Um, in terms of our local anesthetic agents, um, this is my 
lovely kitty um, who is literally an hour and a half full stop full mouth extractions. Um, and you can see that with our local anesthetic agents, he is um, feeling really good eating like a piggy. So our local anesthetic agents are really, if you're not doing it already, are gonna really be a big game changer for you in terms of um, your practice and sending patients home comfortable, making clients um, feel better about their decisions to do these multiple extractions that you've recommended. When I'm talking to clients about nerve blocks or local anesthetics, and this applies to veterinarians, um, but also really good points for the technicians out there. Um, I usually tell clients that local anesthetics or nerve blocks do three things for us. I tell them they block some of our, our pain pathways prior to doing something, something uncomfortable. Um, I used to say prior to doing something painful, but of course veterinarians never do anything painful and we wouldn't want our clients to think we do anything painful. So I use the word uncomfortable. Um, so if we can block some of those pain pathways before our extractions. We can also decrease doses of inhaled and injectable anesthetics um, intra-op and clients always like the idea of less and safer anesthesia. Um, and then if we can have a smoother recovery, earlier return to function with the goal of getting the pet home, clients love hearing that too. Um, so I think a lot of times um, if you're talking to clients about local anesthetics or if your um, staff is going over estimates for um, dental procedures and they include local anesthetics, hitting these three points um, is really a good way to, to sell your clients on the importance of it. So on to instruments. Um, this is our sort of our basic oral surgery pack. I know it looks like a lot and it probably looks like more than what all of you all have um, in GP. It's certainly more than I had in GP. Um, so there's some things in here that you might or might not need, but we'll go through them. Um, and you know, you probably have the basics of all of these things. There might be a couple of things at the end of this that you decide you wanna add. So first of all, <clears throat> we need blades and scalpel handles. I am a big fan of, of number 15 blades, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 15s or 15Cs. 15 15Cs are just kind of a smaller, narrower version of a 15. I think the 15 Cs are a little bit more expensive. Um, they are really, really helpful in kitties and really small dogs. So if you wanted, <clears throat> wanted to keep some of these in your back pocket, um, maybe not use them for every patient, um, but keep them for your cats and your small dogs. They're really nice. Certainly a regular scalpel handle that we all use for surgery is absolutely 100% fine, does the job. Um, if you ever have the opportunity or if you have one of these rolling around in your practice somewhere around scalpel handle, um, these are super nice in the mouth. You can hold them um, in sort of a, a modified pen grasp and they're really nice because you can move really easily around the curves of a tooth. Um, all right. Um, so whatever scalpel you ha handle you have is totally fine. Then we need some periosteal elevators. Um, I would suggest having two that look like this in your pack. Um, this big one is really nice for large dogs. It'll let you move more quickly and efficiently. Um, this one on the left has a bigger end down here um, and a smaller end up here. I would say that if I only had one, I'd have this one on the left, um, using the small end for cats and little dogs um, and using this bigger end for anything else um, is great. Um, so both of these are super useful. Um, again, if you're only gonna have one, I'd stick with the one on the left. It gives you a little bit of versatility and lets you go really down to smaller areas and smaller animals. When we're using our periosteal elevators, remember what we're doing is we're um, sliding this up under our, um, into our gingival sulcus, into our incisions, um, and we're um, using this, this to sharply dissect um, and lift up our, our mucoperiosteal flap. So a finger stop is critical. There are kind of two common ways to hold this instrument. Um, one on the left with your um, the instrument kind of in the palm of your hand in a finger stop is perfectly fine. The one on the right is what we call a modified pen grasp. Um, either one is completely acceptable. I think just try um, and see what's more comfortable in your hand. Um, I think for me, I go back and forth between the two. I probably more commonly use this hold on the left with the bigger instrument. Um, and when I'm doing really fine stuff with, our, with my smaller instrument, um, I tend to use more of a modified pen grasp because it gives me a little more fine control. Um, also lets me use these two fingers, my um, last two fingers as sort of a, a balance or a fulcrum. Um, and so that keeps my hand steady. 
We need curettes. Um, the goal of our curette is to clean out that alveolus after we've extracted that tooth. So you know you've extracted the tooth, there's a big periapical lucency. We wanna get all of that granulation tissue out of the tip of that alveolus where that infected root was. Um, we want something that is small enough for a cat alveolus. Um, again, you know, we have big on the right here, um, smaller, and then this really tiny spoon curette. I don't know that you need this really tiny thing, um, but something in the middle that is at least going to be small enough for you to get in a cat alveolus would be ideal. If you can have all three, that's awesome. Um, but go with something that you can get into a cat alveolus. And then if you're able to have something else that's bigger um, to deal with those big um, alveoli and canines, you know, the, the canine tooth of a dog or upper fourth premolars of dogs, um, those can just be a lot more efficient. In terms of sutures in our packs, um, we have two types of sutures. We use a small pair of suture scissors to cut suture um, because we don't use needle drivers with suture or with um, scissors in them. So we that's why we keep suture scissors in our surgical packs. Um, and then you need some sort of small tissue um, cutting scissors. So either iris scissors, um, which I know are pretty common in dental packs, um, or Lagrange scissors. I am a real fan of these Lagrange scissors. They have this nice kind of curve to them. Um, they do have a sharp little tip there. And the other thing is that the, the blades on these scissors are serrated. Um, and so they cut tissue really, really nicely. Um, so that might be something to consider investing in if you want a better pair of scissors um, than, than iris scissors in your pack. Iris scissors will absolutely do the job though. Um, they may have a little tougher time with some really thick um, gingiva. So you may have to back those up with a small set of mats and bobs or something. Um, or they may just get dull a little bit quicker than you'd like, but they still will absolutely do the job. Um, burrs, so we'll move on to burrs. Um, I really, really love having a burr block. Um, this particular burr, burr block is pretty beat up. It's been around the block. Um, but it is, uh, it's $25 and it is not something that's likely to break um, or go bad. So it's $25, but it should last you really the rest of your time in practice if you don't lose it or break it. Um, but they're sturdy little things and it's really nice to have your burrs right there at hand. Um, you flip the lid over the top of it. You can throw it in your pack with your other dental surgical instruments um, and toss it in the autoclave but um, I think burr blocks are really nice and handy. Um, and it's really nice knowing if your staff set your burr block up the same way all the time, um, you know exactly which burr you want and where it is. You just reach for it and you're good to go. So in terms of burrs that we wanna have um, at your fingertips, ideally we need cutting burrs. Cutting burrs are the ones that more aggressively remove bone or more aggressively cut teeth. Um, and so in terms of, of cutting burrs, I would suggest having in your GP practice um, a couple size round burrs. Usually a four and a six will do just about everything that you need. Um, if you want something smaller, you could go down to a two um, if you're doing something little in cats, but really a four and a six, um, if you kept those in your practice would um, go a long way to, to getting you everything that you need to do. Um, remember round burrs cut on the side. This is kind of like a soccer ball in the end of a stick. So remember round burrs cut on the side, but round burrs also cut on the end. The other um, burr I think is really nice to have is a cross cut taper fisher burr. So a 701 or a 701 L, that one just being longer um, in its cutting surface. The thing to remember about these burrs is they only cut on the side. They do not cut on the tips. So you can't go down on the tips and hope that this will cut. These only cut on the side. But these have a long surface area of cutting. Um, and so that makes them great for sectioning big teeth more efficiently. Um, so if you're trying to go through a, a 80 pound Labrador's canine tooth with a round burr, you're gonna find that you're gonna get through that tooth a little more quickly and efficiently with the larger surface area, larger cutting surface area on this one. Um, I happen to be a big fan of pear-shaped burrs down here on the lower right. Um, it honestly looks like a pear kind of plunked upside down on a stick. Um, we use 330s and 331s. I think that, you know, in general practice, I would kind of consider those optional. Um, I do really like them in kitties. They give me a little more cutting surface area than a really small round burr, but they're nice and narrow. Um, 
And so in my hands, they work really, really well in cats. If, you, if you're either a cat only practice or if you're a practice that does a lot of cats, um, I might consider getting some of those and just trying them out, see what you think. We also need some surgical length round cutting burrs. Um, and these burrs, you can see them over here on the right, um, are the burrs that I use um, to get root tips out. So we certainly don't use these every day, but when you want them and need them, they can be absolutely invaluable. So down below, I sort of put this, you can see a standard length friction grip burr, um, and this is a surgical length burr. And so you can picture that if you have a tooth root and you're looking way down in that hole and you have a tooth root buried way down at the tip of that hole and you're trying to go after it with this, particularly in a small hole like in a cat, um, if you're trying to go about after it with this shorter burr, um, sometimes you just really can't get all the way down there. Or even if you can get this burr all the way down there, getting this burr all the way down there means that the, the head of your high speed is now in your way and you can't see anything. And that doesn't do us any, any good. Um, so these surgical length burrs, again, you're not gonna use them every day, um, but when you need them, they're awesome. We've got quarter rounds, half rounds, and number two rounds. So this is a quarter, this is a half, this is a number two. I would say if you were only going to have one, I would pick a half round. Um, so if you said, well, I think I wanna try that out, but I'm not gonna order a whole bunch of these, um, I would order yourself a handful of half round burrs. Um, they're really not that expensive. Um, keep those on hand and try out some of the tricks and tips we're gonna talk about later in terms of getting tooth roots out. Um, and I think you'll find that those might make a big difference. Um, for me, a half round will do the job in most creatures. There are times in really large animals or certain places that I want the number two. Um, in cats, I really love having a quarter round. So again, if you, if you find you really like the half round and you're using these enough that it really is useful to you, but you do a bunch of kitties, I would, I would play with the idea of getting some quarter rounds as well. So think about that. Um, and then we need some diamond burrs. And our diamond burrs are really for smoothing bone. Um, probably the two I use most commonly um, are this uh, football diamond burr, um, and then second most commonly a cylinder diamond burr. Obviously, you could certainly use these to remove bone the same way you can do use a cutting burr to remove bone, um, but these are going to leave you there all day. So really, our cutting burrs are for removing that buckle bone, for sectioning teeth. These diamond burrs are at the end when your tooth is out of there, um, and we just want to smooth out those bony margins um, and make everything nice and comfortable before we close our soft tissues. And I would reach for either a coarse or a medium in either one of these. Next, we'll move on to getting the tooth out of its little socket. Um, and for that, we wanna talk about both elevators and luxators. So winged elevators, this is a one through a size one through six set that we have. Um, I think most commonly I use one through four. I certainly occasionally use a five, especially in big dogs, probably very, very rarely ask for a six. Um, so either get a one through four or a one through five set or get a whole bunch of one through four sets and have like a, a five or a six as a backup um, to keep, but not, not potentially use every day. Um, so I would think about those. Remember that our winged elevators are meant to use in a twist and hold fashion. Um, so we wanna get that elevator into that periodontal ligament space. We wanna twist and hold. Our holds should be 20 to 30 seconds. That's the same amount of time that your, text, your uh, teenager can send five text messages. But you wanna twist and hold um, because our goal with these winged elevators is that we wanna break down that periodontal ligament by fatiguing it. So we're not trying to cut through it. We're getting into that periodontal ligament space, twisting and holding, we're fatiguing that ligament to break it down. Luxators, on the other hand, um, really function more to cut the periodontal ligament. Um, so if you look at these, um, again, most commonly I use ones, twos, and sometimes threes. Um, so I don't need, think you need extensive sizes in luxators, um, but luxators don't have those wings on the side. Um, they have more of a, a flatter tapered um, and a very sharp end to them really critical with luxators because the function of the luxator is to cut the periodontal ligament to keep them sharp. Um, luxators won't do you any good and they'll simply drive you nuts if they're dull. In addition to those luxators, um, we keep a 1.3S and a 1.8S. Um, so these two guys um, in our um, they don't actually sit in our regular packs, 
Um, we keep these wrapped separately and get them out as we need them. Um, these to me are ideal for cat extractions. I think I tend to use the 1.3 a little bit more often um, than the 1.8. Um, but they're both equally great. Um, they really need to be kept sharp. Um, they can be helpful when you have root tips that you're needing to get out. Um, and again, um, anytime a cat hits the table in our office, um, our technicians get these out because they know that I'm they know that I'm going to be asking for a 1.3. Um, so keep those in mind if you do a lot of cats. Um, if nothing else, I would strongly encourage you to get either a 1.3 or a 1.8. Um, even to just have one in your practice to try um, with your kitties, but I think that it will make um, cat extractions a new experience for you if you don't have these. Um, I'd strongly recommend one or the other or both. Remember with the sharp instruments again in the mouth with these luxators and elevators, it is absolutely critical to have a finger stop. You want your finger right close to the end of that instrument. Um, slipping in the mouth can cause severe trauma. Nobody ever, ever wants to call the ophthalmologist during a dental procedure. So um, just keep an eye that you always um, have a finger stop so that you're not ending up in the nose, in the eye, in the mandibular canal, um, which really makes everyone miserable. Root tip picks. Um, root tip picks are super sharp at the end. Um, they're used to kind of work around that tooth root um, and tease that tooth root out of the alveolus. Um, they come either as angled instruments or um, straight instruments. I personally prefer the straight, um, but it's just what, what works best in my hands. Other people really prefer the, the angled at the end. So whatever you have in your practice is totally fine. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that while we're using these around the tooth root to tease that tooth root out of there, we want to make sure that we don't use them in a prying motion uh, because that, that will break this, this tip. And the tip is, is a little bit more delicate than it looks. In terms of extraction forceps, um, I'm sure everyone has a pair of sort of standard extraction forceps with these beaks that we use to grasp the tooth. Um, extraction forceps are kind of used in a grasp the tooth um, as far down on the tooth as you can, twist and hold with a little gentle twist and hold and pull. Um, so some retraction to get our tooth root out of there. Um, in addition, um, if you do lots of dentistry and broken root tips are gonna happen, um, having just one pair of root tip forceps um, to use on an as needed basis, um, these can be a real lifesaver. So if you do a lot of dentistry um, and a lot of more complicated dentistry or, or animals with retained tooth roots, um, this would be something to consider having um, in your back pocket as well. Minnesota cheek retractors, um, these are great for holding soft tissue out of the way. Um, as an alternative to this, so the, 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 the poor man's Minnesota cheek retractor could be a tongue depressor. Um, they just don't work as well. Um, these sit in your hand really well. Um, they're angled in a way that they kind of stay out of your, your field of view um, as you're trying to hold things out of the way. So they're gonna improve your visualization. Um, they're gonna dramatically um, be a great way to protect your soft tissues from trauma. Um, the last thing that you want is, is a tongue or a cheek um, falling in the line of your burr. Um, they're cheap. If you look online, you can find these anywhere from six to $40. They don't need to be sharpened. They don't need to be maintained. They're going to last you forever. So if you got one or two of these at 10 bucks a pop, they're gonna last you the next 20 years of your practice. Um, so I'd strongly recommend um, keeping, keeping these in your dental packs if you can. Um, again, cheap and they're just gonna last you forever. In terms of suture, um, we tend to use um, monocryl in our practice. Um, what we really wanna shoot for is we ideally want something that's monofilament. monofilament. We want something absorbable um, and we wanna stay small in the mouth. So ideally four aught in big creatures, five aught in cats and little dogs. Um, for in our practice, um, I think the most ideal for me is always a reverse cutting needle. Um, so our four out monocryl comes in a reverse cutting and our five out monocryl doesn't come in a reverse cutting. So we use a taper. Um, so either a reverse cutting or a taper, um, but not a standard cutting needle. Also, um, you know, smaller needles are going to work a whole lot better in the mouth. So keep that in mind when you're choosing um, not only the size of your suture, but the size of your needle. Um, the, our monocryl has this RB1, um, 
And then the four up monocryl has, has an FS2. So those are things to think about. We need some kind of needle holders. Um, we can either use standard needle holders or we can use our Olson Hagers with the um, scissors or cutting. I find that these tend to get a little bit bulky, particularly in small mouths. Um, and often I can't get these angled quite right to really cut my suture short enough or as short as I would like to. Um, so while there's absolutely nothing wrong with using these in the mouth, um, sometimes they're a little bulky or awkward or you just can't get them quite in the right place um, to get the suture in there um, as you can with like a small pair of suture scissors. So either what, whatever needle drivers work best for you are great. Um, and then we want some tissue forceps. So moving on from instruments, we'll kind of go through step-by-step -step on extractions. Um, and the steps that I wanted to talk about, it looks like a lot and really extracting teeth is a lot. It's, it's oral surgery, it's a lot of work. Um, but we wanna talk about our pre-op exam and maintaining a chart and taking our radiographs. We wanna make an incision into the sulcus, then we're gonna create our flap. Then we're gonna remove some buccal bone as needed and section our tooth if it's a multi-rooted tooth. We're gonna either elevate or luxate the tooth or a combination of the two. We're gonna then extract that tooth from its alveolus. We're gonna curette the alveolus, smooth the bone, we're gonna lavage, take our post-op radiograph, create our releasing incision on our flap um, so that we have tension-free closure, and then we're gonna close our flap. So in terms of oral exam and radiographs, it's really critical to remember that we need to combine both our exam and our radiograph findings to confirm that, that um, extraction is necessary. Um, so for example, in this dog, when we looked in this dog's mouth um, on probing, this tooth, this gingiva was still really tight around this tooth. Um, there were no appreciable pockets. This really didn't look like anything at all. Took a radiograph um, and found this. And so this tooth needs to be extracted. And so you can see where my chart would look completely normal, but my x-ray could potentially look awful. Um, and that's where we need to combine those two pieces of information. Um, opposite, or sort of the same vein, but, but sort of opposite problem, this canine tooth, um, so if you have a little needle nose dog, a dachshund or what have you, this canine tooth radiographically doesn't look bad. But when I look at my dental chart, this is my buccal surface. So it's got pockets of threes, which can be quite normal. Um, but on the inside of this tooth, I had pockets of seven, eight, and six. Um, and so from the front of the tooth, the middle of the tooth to the back of the tooth. So these pockets either need um, open deridement and, and some advanced periodontal surgery, or this tooth needs to be extracted because this is heading for an oral nasal fistula. So that's where, you know, you may take an x-ray and things look okay, but if you've done a good job of maintaining your measurements in your pockets and your charting, you're gonna look back in your chart and go, well, even though it looks radiographically fine, I know there's a huge amount of disease um, underneath all the hair and gunk that I just pulled out of the inside of this dog's tooth, the palatal surface of this upper canine tooth. We also need to take our pre-op dental x-rays. Um, we need them primarily for diagnosis, um, but we also need to confirm our root structure. We need to confirm number of roots. So this upper um, third premolar, this 107 in a dog, for example, um, if I looked at this tooth, I might think it was just fine um, and a normal 107. But once I took my radiograph, I could see that there is a root here, a root here, and a root here. This tooth should have two roots and it has three. If I don't take an x-ray and I just section right through the middle of this tooth, expecting to take out two roots, the front one's gonna be attached to this, the back one's gonna be attached to this. I'm gonna to go to elevate. They're both, both those roots are gonna snap. And then I'm gonna spend another half hour, 45 minutes or an hour um, fighting with getting tooth roots out. When if I had known this in advance and sectioned this, things would have gone a whole lot better. So we really need our pre-op x-rays. Um, and then also we need our x-rays to evaluate the bone and the alveolus around the tooth. So we're gonna sort of follow this little kitty through our extraction 
step by steps. So this was a little kitty. He was 11 months old and he came to us. And this is actually a pretty good looking tooth when you look at it. And actually radiographically, it's a really good looking tooth. You might say, oh, well, it's his ligament space just a tiny bit wide. It is, but that's normal for him because he's a, a young cat. Like I said, he was 10 to 11 months old. And the reason we're extracting this tooth is he had an awful class two malocclusion um, and his lower canines were driving huge holes up into his palate. So we're going to follow this little kitty kind of through a bunch of our step-by-step um, -step extractions. So um, first thing that we want to do is we want to incise into the sulcus. Um, so here's our little kitty to start. We want to incise into the sulcus and we want to make sure that we incise into the sulcus all the way around the tooth. The next thing that we want to do is think about our flap. Um, and before we make our flap, let's just stop for a second and think about gingiva and mucosa and how all this works. So the thing to remember about our attached gingiva, so we've got attached gingiva here, we've got alveolar mucosa up here, and then we have this mucogingival line or mucogingival junction as people call it. And the important thing to remember is that um, this gingiva is not stretchy. There's absolutely no give in this gingiva. Alveolar mucosa is stretchy. And when we tell you to close your flap with no tension, do your mucoperiosteal releasing incisions, that's what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to um, undermine the, the periosteal layer on the inside of this so that we can stretch this mucosa over and close our flap. So alveolar mucosa is gonna stretch and allow a tension-free closure. Our vertical releasing incision. So if I was gonna extract this canine tooth, if I wanted to make an incision up here, if I wanted to make another incision back here, if I make an incision from here to my tooth, I am just in gingiva. This is still firmly attached to the tooth and the bone up here. And there's no way you can create any kind of tension for reclosure. So your incisions really need to extend all the way up to here. They need to extend up into that alveolar mucosa. They need to go past this mucogingival line um, to get any kind of release. Um, so that's important to, to know and understand. In terms of flap design, there are kind of three basic flaps that we tend to work with. The first is an envelope flap. So an envelope flap is just incising into your sulcus, usually extending that incision between the tooth in front and the tooth behind um, on both sides of the tooth. And it, you can picture um, if you're making an envelope flap, it's kind of like slitting open the end of an envelope um, and then looking down inside the envelope. So you're kind of spreading the that slit open ends of the envelope, um, but you're not actually lifting mucosa all the way off um, the tooth. For a triangle flap, we're gonna make one releasing incision. So we just incise along the tooth or the teeth that we're looking to deal with, and then we make one vertical releasing incision and we can lift up that flap. So it's a triangle because we have an incision here, we have an incision here, and then this, this this side of the triangle is going to be where we sort of fold this flap over. Um, and then the third one is a pedicle flap. And so a pedicle flap is just essentially creating a pedicle. Um, and so we're going to incise along our teeth and then we're going to make releasing incisions um, in front and behind. So we're going to make two releasing incisions and this whole thing is going to flat down and open up and we're going to have exposure of those roots. Um, so that's our third type of, of flap that we can deal with. So for example, um, places you might use these, so if I wanted to take out this huge canine tooth, obviously we can see that this root goes all the way up to there. But if I make a big pedicle flap here, you can see I can lift this up and I'm gonna get exposure of a good two thirds of this root if I wanted to. Um, so that's gonna give us it says I'm muted. Okay, um, <laughs> good. So um, we can make an envelope, let's say we have a really diseased premolar here um, and our nine-year-old Yorkie, we can make an incision um, around that tooth. Usually with an envelope flap, I would extend this incision um, a little bit further between these two teeth because um, if you make it right to the edge of the teeth, you're likely to, to tear this gingiva as you're getting those tooth roots out. So I would extend it to the end, edge of the tooth in front the edge of the tooth behind, um, open that envelope, we'll be able to section that tooth, get those two, two roots out of there. And then um, 
I'd say this is one of the most common places that I would use a triangle flap is for an upper fourth premolar. Um, because I think these two mesial roots are often your trickiest. And so if you make an incision up here um, and then along the tooth, you're gonna get great exposure of these two um, mesial roots. And then you're still gonna get really good exposure. You're gonna see this much of your distal root and that's probably gonna be enough to do the job and get the tooth out of there. One of the things that's important to think about in terms of flap design is where we're going to place those vertical incisions. And so our goal with this flap, um, we want to incise along into the sulcus. And then as we make our releasing incisions, we want them to be di divergent. So we want them to start kind of at the corners of that tooth that we're working on. And we want to have them kind of up and away from that tooth because we want the base of this flap, which is right up here, to be really broad to preserve the blood supply. Um, so we want divergent incisions. We want a broad base to our flap, so really broad up here. And then we want to make sure that our incisions don't lie over essentially um, where an empty empty alveolus is going to be. So we want our tooth, we want our incisions to remain over bone. So you could picture in this case, if I made this incision here, I extracted this tooth, there would be a big empty space right here. But my incision, so my suture line is still going to lay over top of this otherwise healthy bone out here. That's going to support my incision, and give it a better chance of healing. If I made my incision right, whoop, must go back. If I made my incision right here, um, and then I went to close this, my incision is going to lie over big empty space. It's going to want to sag. It's going to pull on my suture line, um, and it's going to have less chance of healing well. In terms of this incision back here. Again, we want to take this um, from the, the front edge of this canine tooth to the back edge of this canine tooth. Here we've gone to the middle of the next tooth. Um, and ideally, we don't want to do that and then make an incision way back here. So I'd rather have this divergent incision look more like this one where we start at the edge of the back of that tooth um, and have it out over here. In terms of making those um, Releasing incisions, I think one of the things that sometimes creates a lot of frustration, um, and this is really subtle little sort of tip or trick, um, but when you make those releasing incisions, you want to incise all the way down to bone. If you're just doing partial thickness incisions and then you try to get your periosteal elevator in there, um, it's not gonna go well, it's gonna take you forever, it's gonna be really frustrating. So incise all the way down to bone. And then um, what I like to do is remember we've already incised into our sulcus in this dog. And then I went and made my releasing incision. And a lot of times I like to take my blade and turn it instead of, you know, the sort of straight up and down that I'm using to make this incision. I'm going to turn it a little bit, flatten it out and kind of turn it around the corner and almost use my blade to connect it to my incision in my sulcus so that I make sure that this incision that I made and the incision I made into my insulcus, that I'm using my blade to kind of connect those two around that corner. And the reason being is the next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is elevate this flap. And if you've got a nice sharp incision um, between these two, and I ask you to put your periosteal elevator right in there to start elevating, you're gonna have these two incisions connected all the way down to bone, all the way down to tooth, and it's gonna be a much nicer start for your periosteal elevation. Um, so think about that next time you're doing an extraction, make sure you take it all the way down to bone and see if you can just, just turn your blade just a little bit and kind of connect those two incisions. And I think you'll find it's a much nicer, nicer starting point for your periosteal elevator and you'll probably be a lot happier. So we're gonna incise all the way around the tooth in this cat. Sorry, our focus is not ideal, but we made um, just a single releasing incision back here. If we had a big dog that we were taking a canine tooth out, um, this was a little seven-year-old pit bull with a fractured tooth. Um, I desperately tried to talk her mom into root canal treatment because it would have made everyone's life more easy, but she didn't want to. So we ended up extracting it. Um, these are tough, tough extractions because you have this tooth that, yeah, it's fractured and yeah, there's some abscess down at the tip, but you got a huge expanse of root that's really healthy and these are tough. Um, so for this one, we made that same incision that I made over here in my kitty. So I made a divergent incision back here, but I also elected to make, sorry, so nice. a second releasing incision. So a pedicle flap in this big dog because I want all of this root exposed to work getting this tooth out. 
So we're going to elevate the flap and I would suggest when you elevate the flap that we start at one corner. Um, if we can start at one corner, whether it's the front end or the back end, it doesn't matter, um, but start at one corner, try to get that corner up um, past the mucogingival junction. Once you get that one corner, so don't try to get gingiva up all along the way and then work past your mucogingival line. Start at one corner, get the gingiva, get past that mucogingival junction, that mucogingival oh. line, and then work your way up and back or down and so forward, whichever, but start at the corner um, and then just progress up and back until you've got that whole flat also remember that we want to elevate gingiva all the way around the tooth. So we no, want okay, to, while well, we're going to elevate a huge area out here on the outside of the tooth, so on the lingual or the buccal surface, um, or I'm sorry, on the, the buccal or the labial surface on the outside of the tooth, we want to also make sure that we elevate on the lingual or palatal side of the tooth. We don't have to do a huge elevation in there. We just want to get about two millimeters or so up one, so that we're not traumatizing um, that tissue that we're going to want to use to close. Um, so we're not traumatizing it in the process of extracting. And <clears throat> particularly important, if we have a multi-rooted tooth that we need to section, we don't want to have um, this gingiva still attached. We're sectioning through a multi-rooted tooth, and then we're tearing up that gingiva that we want to use to close. Um, so it's going to help us avoid trauma to the soft tissues on the inside of the tooth um, pre preserving that soft tissue for closure. So we're going to remove buccal bone. We want to use a water-cooled high-speed handpiece. We want to use a cutting burr. Um, use the, the sort of biggest burr that you need to get the job done efficiently. And then we talk about bone removal. And the question is always bone removal. How much is enough? What is too much? You need to remove enough bone to get the job done. And that I think is not a, how much do you need for each particular tooth? It's how much do you need in that tooth, in that patient? Does this dog have you know, tooth resorption and it is gonna be a nightmare to get this resorbing root out of there? Um, or is this you know, a nine-year-old Yorkie with a mouthful of green teeth and maybe we don't need to remove that much bone to get the tooth out of there? So you need to remove enough, enough bone to get the job done in your patient in your hands. Um, and I think the way that I like to think about it is we need to do it in a way that can be efficient. Um, so if you have um, a canine tooth on a five-year-old pit bull that's fractured and you need to remove bone to get that tooth out of there, I would much rather see you remove another three, four, five millimeters of bone and have that tooth out efficiently than work really hard at trying to save bone, trying to remove less bone, um, but then it takes you an extra hour, hour and a half to get that canine tooth out. Um, you've, you've put the mouth through a lot of trauma, you've struggled a lot, you're super frustrated, you missed your lunch, um, you're jammed up against appointments, and that extra hour, hour and a half of anesthesia is not to your patient's benefit. Um, so whatever, however much bone you need to have the tooth removed efficiently with the least amount of trauma, um, is the right amount of bone. Um, so if you've removed bone, you're really struggling, things aren't going well, then remove some more bone um, and try to make your life easier. In terms of sectioning teeth, and we'll get a little bit more um, if, if questions pop up about how do I section this tooth or how to section that tooth. Um, I've got some really detailed slides on how to section particularly um, lower first molars, upper fourth premolars, upper molars. So I think the ones that are trickier are to section. Um, we wanna split, um, the goal of sectioning, we wanna split our multi-rooted teeth into two or three single-rooted teeth. So that's really what we're doing. Um, I like to make good use of a cross-cut taper fissure burr. You can also use a large round burr, um, but you wanna use something that's pretty um, sizable and efficient, particularly in big teeth. Um, so that you're not spending a huge amount of time trying to section teeth. You wanna start at the furcation and section out through the crown. We don't wanna start here and section um, towards the mouth because if we slip, then we're gonna create soft tissue or hard tissue trauma up here. So start at the furcation, you know, identify your furcation and section outwards towards the crown. I think one of the biggest thing that leads to root fractures um, in my hands um, and in my experience is incomplete sectioning. So if you think you have those two, two parts of a tooth separated and you go to get your elevator in there, you twist and hold and 
things don't give it all, stop and make sure that you went all the way through this tooth. Because if those two pieces are still attached and you start to twist and hold, um, you're not gonna get that give. Um, and what's likely gonna give is the crown and then you're gonna end up with a root fracture and going after tooth roots. Um, so incomplete sectioning, I think is one of the biggest causes of root fractures. So if you um, are really diligent and sort of pay attention to your sectioning, it may make your extracting a whole lot easier. When we section teeth, um, obviously you can start with vocation and section this tooth this way. One thing to keep in mind, and this is maybe something that you don't commonly do, but this is sort of in that tips and tricks category. If I section through this tooth here, um, and then I try to elevate this tooth and elevate that tooth, and I'm twisting and holding on each side of these, but I still have these two pieces of crown knocking into each other, it's gonna get in the way of my twisting and holding and it's gonna get in the way of my trying to use my elevators and, and extraction forceps to get these out of there. Sometimes removing a bigger chunk of the tooth. And so this is um, one of Dr. Brian's photos, um, but removing these little triangular pieces out of these teeth. If you can imagine if I've removed the big bulk of this crown, it's gonna leave me with these two shorter, you could almost pretend these were two little incisors if you wanted to, um, but these two pieces of teeth that aren't hung up against each other in the crown, and it may make your um, elevating and extracting easier. So you can see in this picture, if I just sectioned this way, um, we'd still have this big piece in the middle. You can see that when I've removed that little triangle, look at how much more space and how much more room I have to work around that tooth. So again, something to try um, might make your life a little bit easier. Takes you an extra 30 seconds to make that extra sectioning cut. But if that saves you 10 minutes on your extracting end, bonus. So something to, something to try. The next thing that we're gonna do is elevate. In this little kitty that we've been following, I've, you can barely see it, but I've got my little 1.3 um, luxator. And so I'm gonna use that luxator all the way around the tooth to cut through my ligament space. Um, in my bigger dog, I'm gonna use um, my elevators. You can see that I've got my finger stopped there. So even if I slipped here, this instrument can't go any farther than there. It can't land up in the nose. So luxate or elevate. When we're using luxators and elevators, remember our goal is to be in the periodontal ligament space. One of the things, again, sort of tip and trick, um, one of the things that's often really hard is to luxate uh, or elevate on the backside of this canine tooth because you find that the crown's in the way and you're kind of at this awkward angle. You'd kind of like your elevator to be up this way, um, but you're, instead you're kind of stuck with it this way because your crown is in the way. Remember this tooth is going. And if you've got a big dog with a big crown and you can't get your instrument in there um, because it's in your way, there's no reason you can't cut the crown off. Leave yourself enough to hang on to, please. Um, but you can cut the bulk of this crown off. See how getting that out of the way gets this instrument much further up into that space, gives me a lot more room to work. So again, something to consider that may help you a little bit. In terms of extraction, we want to grasp the tooth as far apically, so as far down the tooth as we can. Remember we talked earlier, you want to do sort of a gentle twist and hold with some traction. If you do a gentle twist and hold in one direction with some traction, you get a little bit of give and you're like, yeah, yep, this guy's going to come out. Great. Do a little gentle twist and hold the other direction, some gentle traction. You might do that a time or two. Remember these twists and holds are still the 20, 30 seconds that we talked about with our elevators. Um, so if you do that, back the other way, do that. Things are giving, great, keep going. If you do that, things aren't giving at all, stop and elevate some more because you're not to the point of extracting that tooth. So we're gonna curette out our alveolus in our little kitty. We're gonna lavage. Remember that you don't wanna shoot air down into a tooth root socket into an alveolus. So just use your water, not your air. We're gonna use our um, diamond burr. So in this case, I'm using the football diamond burr. Um, I'm gonna smooth away those sharp bone edges. Then we need to do our mucoperiosteal release. This may strain my technology. Um, I have a video for you on that. So let's see if I can get that to work. Hopefully it doesn't play it. Oop. Let's see. Oh, it's playing. Is it playing? Excellent. Okay. I'm sorry it's a little bit smaller. It is what it is. But um, so now that you can see this, um, we want to use either scissors or a blade. We want to get right in between that 
fibrous layer on the inside of our alveolar mucosa, um, and we want to cut along there. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, I think it's a little deceptive on this video, it kind of looks like we're way up at the top of the root. We're really just above that mucogingival line. So you don't need to be all the way up on top of the nose here. Um, we're just on top of the mucogingival line. You can see how you can also use a blade um, to do the same thing. Just need to use it carefully so that you don't go through that alveolar mu mucosa. Um, we wanna go back the whole length of this tooth. Um, and you can see how much further I can stretch that now. Um, you can even take things a little bit further. Ah! What did I do? Great. Yep. All right. So hopefully you get a good idea of what that's supposed to be doing. Um, and then let's see, we'll move on. Okay, let's go back into, excuse me just a second, we'll jump back into presenting mode. So important to do our mucoperiosteal release. Um, and then the next thing we want to do is make sure that we debride our soft tissue margin. So you see this kind of irregular, angry, um, epithelialized tissue. Um, we want to make sure that we clean up the uh, margins so that we're um, sewing fresh margins to fresh margins. We want to take our pole stop x-ray. We want to confirm our extraction. We also want to prove that there's no jaw fracture, no symphyseal separation, that I didn't have any complications. And then we're gonna suture. And when we're suturing, we're gonna use our monofilament suture. And I like to think in terms of two millimeter bites, two millimeters apart. So two millimeters of bite through each side of your tissue, um, and then sutures about two millimeters apart. For post-op uh, care in our hands here, um, pain control is either non-steroidals, non usually is non-steroidals and opioids um, in some combination. Um, I prefer sort of a slightly longer course of NSAIDs with a few days of opioids at the start. Um, obviously, if you have patients that can't take NSAIDs, then you need to modify, um, but that's sort of our general approach. We tend to like to use an oral rinse um, post-op. Make sure ideally that you're not using um, an alcohol-based oral rinse, because that's not going to be good for tissue healing and not going to be good for um, comfort in our patients. Um, we really like this one um, made by Dermazoo, um, but there are a lot of ones out there. I usually do a soft diet for 10 to 14 days, no chew toys until we recheck. That includes sticks, um, e-collars. We have young, goofy dogs with um, extensive incis incisions that I think are gonna be hard to keep their mouths off of things, puppies, um, or if I've done a big oral nasal fistula repair, um, I will consider basket muzzles in some of our patients. And then I usually recheck patients in about two weeks. So a quick run through of some challenging teeth. Um, for me, those are often um, maxillary fourth premolars, maxillary molars, mandibular canine teeth, and mandibular first molars. So if we start with a maxillary fourth premolar. Um, we are gonna make our um, releasing incisions. And for me, usually making that triangle flap is the most useful. So that's what I've done here. Um, we've removed our buckle bones so I can see um, both of my buckle roots. So I have to remember, I've got two mesial roots. So I have mesial buckle and mesial palatal. Palatal roots always the one that hangs people up. And then um, we have this big, kind of wide distal root. Um, we can obviously section through there, but remember we talked earlier that if we take out this triangular piece um, and section out this triangular piece, it, gets, it gives us a lot more space to work. The other thing that I think is often really tricky um, with these upper fourth premolars is often trying to get in between the back of this upper fourth premolar and this first molar tooth, these are often really tight together. Um, remember that this upper fourth premolar is going. If you need to section off a small area down in this lower left picture, a small area um, off the back of that upper fourth premolar, 
to give yourself space to get an instrument in there, feel free. It doesn't matter if you damage the tooth that's leaving. You just have to be super careful not to damage the tooth that's staying. Um, but if taking this little edge off, depending on the anatomy of your dog and how diseased that tooth is, if that makes your life easier and more efficient, then I think it's a great idea. I think the hardest part about these upper fourth premolars um, is sectioning off that palatal root. And it's always tempting to kind of want to section down the middle of this thing. And it's important to remember that this palatal root is really small. Um, so it's much more narrow and skinny than our other two roots. Um, and so if we look at this um, picture, I've taken that wedge out. So I've separated the front and the back on the buccal surface. And then when I go to section out the palatal, I'm just gonna go right through there. In this picture, so I used a model here. Um, and in this picture, if I have my dog on its side or on its back, so from where we're sitting, we're sitting at the nose of the dog and we're looking back into the mouth and we're looking at the front of this upper fourth premolar. Um, and so you can see that's where I'm gonna put my burr to section that root. And if I stand the tooth up, pull the tooth out of the model, um, and if I stand it up and you're looking at it, I'm really just sectioning off this little tiny cusp on the inside. And one thing that I like to do when I'm trying to position my burr and where should I be cutting, um, remember you're gonna end up with a big piece of tooth out here and a little tiny piece over here, but that's what you should get. Don't try to split this guy down the middle. The other thing that I like to think about is where I'm gonna place my burr. And the reason I took this picture was because if you can get your burr um, so that if you picture your burr standing straight up and down here um, and then tip it about 20 degrees towards the inside of the mouth, that's gonna land that burr right into that space. So if you cut right through there, you're gonna do a great job of splitting these two roots apart. Um, so that's what it looks like in the model. And that's what it would look like just so you see where your burr is going. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of a visual. It's complicated. It's a much easier thing to show in person, um, but hopefully my attempts to show it that way are a little bit helpful. So we're gonna section through there as we look in the mouth again, big piece here, little piece there, um, and then this big distal root. So then we extract our two, um, so our mesial buckle, um, and distal buckle, our, our distal root and our mesial buckle. And then we face the palatal root of the upper fourth premolar, which can be a nemesis for many, many, many people. Um, and I think one of the things that, that um, sometimes it gets lost in trying to get this palatal root out of there is that we want to treat this palatal root the same way we treated this root out here. So remember when we went to get this root out here, what did we do first? We removed buccal bone so we could see more of the root. Um, and then we went in, we elevated, we removed it. So when you face this palatal root, don't just dive in with your elevators feel free to remove some buccal bone. So you can look at the difference between these two pictures. If I remove buccal bone here, um, then I can get my elevator in here, I can get my elevator back here if I need to, twist and hold, and that root is gonna come up so much more easily. So give yourself license to treat this palatal root just the way you treated the one on the outside. You're facing a big, big piece of, of buccal bone there. Go ahead and remove some of that buccal bone get a better look at that root, give you more space to remove it. Then we're going to lavage, smooth, take our post-op x-ray, curette, um, and then close. So those are my tips for, tips for maxillary fourth premolars. Um, maxillary molar extraction, I think, holds a lot of complicating factors, um, one of which is um, you know, dealing in the, in the depths of the back of the mouth. Um, the other is sectioning. And then lastly is figuring out how to get um, this flat, a flap to close over what ends up being a really wide empty space. So if we start looking in the back of this pit bull's mouth, um, we're gonna take out 208 or 209 and 210. Um, so I've made an incision. I started um, my, into the, my incised into the sulcus along the back of this upper fourth premolar. Um, could I have left that down there and done a releasing incision up here? I could, um, but I, I tend to just take a little bit of, of tissue or, or a little incision into my sulcus along the back of that upper fourth premolar, knowing I'm going to lay that right back down when I'm done and it's going to heal really well. Um, 
So I'm going to elevate along its size into the sulcus and then elevate along both of these teeth. And so I've elevated my flap. I can use my Minnesota cheek retractor to hold things back. Then I'm going to section my teeth. When we look at sectioning um, these upper molars, we want to section them in a T shape. And one of the ways I kind of picture where I want to be and where I want to go is that there's a good sized cusp here. There's a good sized cusp here. Remember, there's a, essentially a cusp attached to each tooth root. So we've got a good cusp here with kind of a longer, thinner root, a good cusp here with a longer, thinner root. And then we've got this kind of big molary looking, multiple smaller cusps, but this big area that goes to a much shorter, stubbier, rounder, fatter root. Um, same here. We're going to section these in a T shape. So across um, and then down between these two roots. And we want all of these three incisions to connect. So I've sectioned through here, I've sectioned through here. So I've got two buckle roots, two buckle roots, and then I've done across the T down there. That separates this big sort of more bulbous root of these two teeth in the inside there. So the palatal root is, is bigger and sort of rounder and more bulbous. So we're going to elevate, go back real quick. We're going to elevate these roots as we would any other tooth roots. Um, and then one of the things that I like to do when you get these two, the, these two roots for the 209 and two roots for the 210 out of there the, on the buckle side, and we've got these two roots in there, always the last thing I want to do is sort of blindly stick an elevator up towards the eyeball in the back of the mouth where I feel like I have less control. And one thing I found that works really well with these two teeth um, is to use your elevator in a bit of a, a wheel and axle. And for everybody who's been teaching like third and fourth grade science to their children for the past eight or nine months, um, probably remembers simple mechanics. Um, and if you use your instrument in sort of a wheel and actual axle motion, so you can see I've slid between these two teeth and I have then turned in sort of a clockwise or counterclockwise, either one motion. And you can see where initially I could only get that much space between these two teeth. If I turn and twist and hold for 20 or 30 seconds, I've actually really created loosened the periodontal ligament space around this tooth really nicely. Um, and sometimes if you catch an edge on this tooth, if you keep twisting and holding, you'll literally roll that whole root right out of there because it is so, it's so big and bulbous, it's not long and skinny. Um, I would suggest if you're gonna do this wheel and axle and you're taking both these teeth out, start with going between the nine and the 10, because if you, if you start up here, and get the nine out, you don't have anything to roll the 10 against. So start back here, use the, the weight of the nine, um, you know, use that as sort of your, your fulcrum, roll to your wheel and axle, um, roll against the root of the 10, um, that'll loosen up and then it may just roll right out on you, particularly if it's diseased. If it's not, you can grasp it with your extraction forceps, um, twist and hold and get that out of there. And then come up here and do that same wheel and axle against the back of the eight um, to roll the nine out of there. Um, and that'll serve you really well. So if you've never tried that sort of wheel and axle approach, um, try it. You can see that I don't necessarily have a finger stop really close in there. One, that's because it's taking pictures so for you guys to see, um, but mostly because I'm not pushing on this instrument. I'm not pushing the sharp part of the instrument in any scary directions. I'm literally laying it between these two and I'm twisting and holding um, in, in a lengthwise fashion. So I'm not pushing this instrument anywhere that can cause harm. One of the important things um, when we're doing this maxillary molar extraction, so it's, you've got now this just very daunting, huge space. We need to, you know, curette and smooth and lavage. Um, but make sure that you elevate your soft tissues along the inside of this tooth all the way along the back here. If this soft tissue, um, this gingiva is still really stuck to this tooth, you got all this stuff up here that you can see how stretchy it looks, it wants to give, um, but if it's still stuck to the edge of the tooth, it's not. So use your periosteal elevator um, and get that gingiva all the way off 
the bone all the way around that tooth. And then um, you can either use your scissors. Sometimes I'll actually use my periosteal elevator um, almost to just give this tissue a bit of a stretch. Important thing to remember is way up in here is your maxillary artery. So if you're gonna use anything sharp back here like scissors, you wanna keep it in the same plane as the hard palate. So if you just stay in the plane of the hard palate, don't go poking up towards the eye or up towards the ear, um, you're gonna stay away from the maxillary artery. Um, so what you're trying to do is just lo loosen up all the, that periosteal release all along here, um, keeping your instrument again in the same plane as the hard palate back there. Um, and then you can see you get this big piece of tissue that will stretch all the way across. So this gingiva comes and wraps behind this upper fourth premolar to protect and save that guy. Ooh, sorry. Um, and then we've got our incision closed all through there. Um, so that's a really nice way to close that um, upper molar area. Mandibular canine teeth, we all know they're hard. Um, remember referring for root canal treatment is always an option. Um, I think the hardest, hardest teeth are the healthy Labradors and the healthy pit bulls that have a fractured tooth. Um, the tooth is completely periodontally sound, but you know it's gonna become a tooth root abscess if it's not already. Um, and those are a real nightmare to extract. Make sure you use large broad-based flaps as you go after these teeth. You can see that this is all the way down into that stretchy mucosa I've released back here. When I lower this flap down, I'm gonna be able to see all the way down. So a good two thirds of the root of this canine tooth. Um, and that's what I'm gonna to need to get my job done. Use sharp instruments. Um, one of the things about maxillary canine teeth is sometimes there's not a lot of good places to twist and hold against. Um, your incisors aren't gonna be really useful for that. They're gonna give before your canine tooth is. Um, and so there's often not a lot of really good bone to twist and hold against. And so sometimes using really sharp luxators can be really useful. Um, so if you don't have luxators, consider getting a pair of luxators, um, getting a one and a two, maybe a three. Um, you know, you may not use them every day, but when you want them, they'll be there. And make sure we keep them really, really sharp because they work by cutting that ligament. We want, want them to be sharp. Uh, mandibular first molars, um, pre-op radiographs, you wanna know what you're getting into, sharp patient, sharp instruments, keep your patients. Um, also consider a referral. Um, if this makes you feel a little nauseous, don't do it. With Mandibular first molars, good sectioning is crucial. This is another tooth where having a lot of the bulk of that crown out of the way is really helpful. The other thing is remember that a lot of these teeth, you'll find the eights and the nines really smashed up close together. You'll find the nines and the tens really close together. So if nipping off the backs and the fronts a little bit of that tooth, keeping um, the teeth that are staying safe, lets you get your instruments in there, that's really good. The other thing to think about when you're extracting um, mandibular first molars is cradle that mandible in your hand, have that mandible in your hand um, as something to push against, but hang on to it and pay attention to what you're feeling in your hand. If you've got your elevator in there and you're twisting and holding and you're feeling that torque in your hand, that's probably too much torque on that mandible and you need to slow down or back off and be just more patient, um, reach for some luxators, um, but slow down so that you, that torque that you're putting through the tooth doesn't continue to torque that's then gonna fracture the mandible. So avoiding complications, we're gonna pick up the pace just a hair so that we have some time for questions at the end. Um, in terms of avoiding complications, um, I've said it before, I'll say it again, Use sharp instruments, use appropriately sized instruments, take pre-op x-rays, remove enough bone to get the job done safely, take post-op radiographs, use your periosteal releasing incision so that when you're closing that flap, there is no, no, no attention on it. Um, don't, make sure you don't rush or try to do more than you have time to do. If this needs you mean, means you need to stage something, then you need to stage something rather than try to rush. Don't take on more, that you're trained, more than you're trained to do or more that you feel comfortable doing. Um, so if you need more CE, if you need more help, um, you know, take your time, get that education, move on to those bigger teeth or more challenging teeth later. Don't take extractions lightly. They are oral surgery, they're a big deal. Um, don't forget to give the client options to avoid extraction. So offer them re referral for root canal. 
um, and don't allow any tension on your flaps. We've all seen this dog that either has an oral nasal fistula or is the I'm going to be an oral nasal fistula poster child. Um, comes in with all the snacks and the food and the hair and stuff stuck up in this really no more healthy gingiva around this tooth. And you're looking at that going, yeah, not only do I have to get this big canine tooth out, but I have to figure out how to close this. So avoiding oral nasal fistulas, you want to create a large flap. Um, and in this case, a releasing incision here, I'm going to incise into my sulcus, which means going all the way up there and behind the tooth. Um, I'm going to incise along this tooth. In this particular dog, I can tell you that radiographically this tooth needed to go. However, if you're faced with this and you're looking at this and feeling like you don't have enough healthy tissue over here to bring forward and close this hole, I have no problem, no qualms with sacrificing a first premolar, um, making a big wide incision like this. If it means you need to sacrifice enough premolar or a first premolar to get enough tissue to close this well, do it once, do it right. Um, I think that is absolutely 100% legitimate and I would back you to the ends of the earth on that one. Um, so if you need to sacrifice a first premolar um, to give yourself enough space and enough flap and enough soft tissue to get this closed, Go for it. We're going to elevate and extract. One of the important things with these oral nasal fistulas is we need to make sure that we divide the margins of our flap. That means that this gross, awful edge that I elevated up off this tooth, I need to divide that so I have a nice, fresh, bleeding edge. I think the thing that often gets forgotten um, is debriding this. So if I suture my nice, fresh edge to this mush of granulation tissue, it is not going to heal, it's going to break down. So I need to get my curette to bride all this out of there, and then I need to use my periosteal elevator, elevate this edge a little bit, and I need to debride this margin of one, two millimeters, whatever it takes, just to get a nice fresh edge. So we're showing sewing fresh edges to fresh edges, two millimeter bites, two millimeters apart. So don't forget to debride our edges, and particularly in these um, in these oronasal fistulas, we need to divide everything all the way around so we're, so we're sewing fresh to fresh. Um, Post-op care for oronasal fistulas, hard plastic e-collars at all times. I know that the soft ones are nice and the donuts are nice and yeah, they might keep this dachshund's paws away from his mouth, but it is not gonna keep him from sliding his face on the carpet or the couch or the bed. Um, so hard plastic e-collar at all times. Consider a basket muzzle. I'd rather spend a week or two in a basket muzzle and have this heal than have to go back and do it again. Soft um, diet, no chew toys, no sticks. Um, Warn clients that they're going to have blood tinged nasal discharge if there's communication with a nasal cavity, and often in these guys there is, and then recheck these guys. Really important to follow up. We want to avoid mandibular fractures, um, particularly when getting canine teeth out of there. I think some of the biggest causes, um, dull instruments, um, poor technique, particularly too much force on an elevator, um, lack of patience. If you need more patients, live with a toddler or a uh, teenager during a pandemic, and you'll have all the patients you ever needed, more you ever thought you could have. Um, but lack of patients um, and sometimes unhealthy bone. Um, so sometimes having really diseased or unhealthy bone is really not in your favor. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you have a mandibular fracture, um, First of all, we wanna um, make sure that if, if whatever flap we have here, that we do some releasing and close our flaps so things can heal. Um, one option is always to refer, give us a call, send us an x-ray, we'll talk about it over the phone. Um, if we need to see it, we'll see it. Um, if you're able to put a symphyseal wire on in your practice, you could. Um, if you wanna refer it for symphyseal wiring, we can do that. Um, and then I would advise, say in this particular case, that we close this up, that we get this fracture to heal, and then at the time of wire removal, we'll go back and tackle getting the rest of that tooth root out. If you're doing a symphyseal wire, um, again, we're gonna make an incision under the chin, use our needle, run a wire up and around, pull this needle out, reposition the needle, put the wire back in this side so that we have two pieces of wire coming out the bottom of the chin, um, tighten it. We're going to end up with a wire that looks something like this. Um, this is obviously a different kitty because he has two teeth. 
different kitty because he has two teeth, but this is what our, we want our symphysial wire to look like. Um, not too tight. There's always going to be a little space there for our symphysis. And we want to take our, so we want to post off, we want to check our occlusion, we want to take a radiograph, and then soft diet, diet, allow bone healing, and then think about having that wire come out in about five to six weeks. And at that point, we'll tackle the root tip. All right, <clears throat> root tip retrieval. Um, identify your tooth roots first. So you're going to take x-rays, identify your tooth roots. Sometimes your tooth roots are in the middle of the hinterlands and you have no idea where they are looking through your soft tissues. Um, so using 25 gauge needles. So pop a little 25 gauge needle where you think it is. Um, I put this one up here because it made me look really good because I guessed really well on the first try. But put your needle where you think it is and you, you take an x-ray and you can say, aha, I'm right on that tooth root. Or look, no, I'm about three millimeters in front of it or behind it but it'll let you know where you need to make your incisions and where you need to chase those tooth roots. One of the things that sometimes happens, so if you're in the middle of an extraction, you snap off a tooth root and you're like, Bleh, I can't see it. And now there's all this mushy root and this bone and I can't see anything. Sometimes taking your diamond burr and smoothing off the surface of that root. So I've smoothed off the surface of that root. And now look, I can actually see, I can define where my root is. So there's the pulp canal, there's the inside. Um, but it just gives me, with this all smoothed off, um, it really lets me see exactly where that tooth root is. So looking down on that tooth root, I can see where it is. The next thing that we want to do is use one of those surgical length, really tiny. So this is a half round um, in this dog. So we want to use, we want to look down on this tooth root, use my surgical length half round, and I want to just trace the outline of this tooth. So I want to sort of want to sort of visualize where that ligament space would be around the tooth and create a moat, just like a moat around the castle, you're going to create a moat around this tooth. This moat was a little bit, I, I made it a little bit bigger than I might have if I was um, not taking a picture of it, only because when it was much, much smaller, it was very hard for you guys to see on the picture. Um, but again, it's a really tiny moat, and that's where using a half round or a quarter round is really important. So you're going to identify the root. If we took, if we created a moat and took an x-ray, it might look a little bit like that. And then use a root tip pick um, to tease that root out. Um, you can use a small luxator. Also might be a really good place for your root tip forceps. Never, never, never burr out root tips. So if you have a root tip sitting in the base of this alveolus, don't push down on it with a burr. Remember that the bone at the base of this alveolus, the bone down here is much, the tooth root is much harder than the bone at the base of the alveolus. And you run a really high risk of pushing root tips into the mandibular canal or into the nose. Um, and those become a whole nother, whole nother set of challenging. So in summary, um, our extractions are oral surgery. Um, treat them like they're a really big deal. Charge for them like they're a big deal. Um, and um, you know, know that know that you're getting into a lot, and it, it takes a lot to to do extractions, and particularly many extractions in one day. So give yourself license to pace yourself or stage things. Um, communicate with your owners. A lot of owners will be very understanding. Um, maintain sharp instruments. I can't be stressed enough. Um, allow enough time to do the job well, you know, again, stage or refer as needed. Um, make sure we're taking pre and post-op x-rays. They're absolutely essential. They are standard of care. Um, anything goes wrong um, and you don't have pre or post-op x-rays, it will not hold up in court. And try to, your best to prevent complications and seek help when you, when you have any complications. We are a phone call, an email away. Um, our phone room is instructed to you guys have a patient under anesthesia to do everything possible to interrupt us. Even if one of the doctors can't get on the phone right away, our technicians can pick up, talk to you, see what we need to do, put you on speakerphone, um, and we'll get you guys through whatever we need to, to do to help you out. <laughs> Just one more quick thing. Um, couple resources. Um, these are some good, good books and articles. Um, Dr. Holmstrom's, um, I think this is, I, I think I copied the wrong one. I think there's actually a third edition out that's digital, um, but Venice, Veterinary Dentistry, a Team Approach is a really great book. Um, this British Small Animal Veterinary, Veterinary Association Manual of 
of uh, dentistry and oral surgery is really great. It has way more in there than you would need for general practice. Um, but the benefits to it um, are that it has tons and tons of pictures. So it has lots of general practice information. No, are you gonna read the chapter on root canal? Probably not, um, but it has lots of good GP information um, and it has lots and lots and lots of um, photographs and, and photo series of step-by-step -step things. So it's really an excellent book. And as textbooks go, it is only $100. Um, if you can get this Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery article, um, this is also an excellent step-by-step, um, -step, tons and tons of pictures. Um, it's a 13 page article, um, but it's mostly pictures. Um, and it's a really great illustrated guide. So I'd strongly remember if you can, uh, recommend if you can get a copy of that to, to give a look at that, especially if you're doing a lot of kitties. All right. We have a bunch of questions. Actually, you don't need to mute yourself. If you want to just stop sharing your screen, I will share my screen and I've got the questions in a Microsoft Word doc for you. Okay. So removing, can I share? Share. They're already seeing. Oh, they're seeing. Okay. Yeah. Like, let's see. Removing lower canines, small dog lower canines, really tricky. Special instruments you have safely without do this safely without mandibular trauma. I think this is where um, using luxators, using really sharp luxators, can be really really helpful. Um, there's a super fancy instrument called a periotome that you can buy from IM3 in Vancouver, Washington. Um, that's about. $3,000. Um, if you do lots of them in your big busy practice, that might be worth an investment for you. It's called a periotome. Um, and it is a, a loud vibrating machine that breaks down your periodontal ligament. Um, but short of that, I would think about making use of your luxators um, where you're going to be cutting ligament more, less twisting and holding. Um, but the key to that is they have to stay really sharp. Um, how do you decide which flap to use? Always done pedicle flaps with every tooth that I take. Um, I think he, for me, um, if, I, if I look at a tooth and I think that I can, I rarely do just envelope incisions. Um, so I either do a triangular flap or pedicle flap. Um, I think I do tend to use a lot of triangular flaps because a lot of times if I make one releasing incision and then um, and size into my sulcus and lift that up, um, as long as my front releasing incision is long enough, I feel like I can often get what I need to see with just that triangular flap. But I also look at that and say, well, if I lift that triangular flap and I still don't have everything I need to see um, or enough room to work, then I can always make that second releasing incision in the back. Um, so if you, if you, if, you're fine, if there's no reason not to make a pedicle flap and that, that gets you the visualization you need, then go for it. It just makes for more suturing on the, on the other end of things. Um, so maybe start to play with if you, if you feel like you can make one incision, um, one releasing incision and size into the sulcus, lift up that flap as a triangle. If you can see everything you need to see and you have like a Minnesota cheek protector and something that can hold your tissues back out of the way, go with it. If you need more space, make the other release. That might be a way to sort of play with those two options. Um, do you still recommend staging? Do you perform a routine dental cleaning with dental radiographs to determine treatment and extract at a later time or perform unexpected extractions at the same time? Um, I think that um, I, I rarely do a routine cleaning x-rays wake an animal up and then go back and do extractions. Um, but I'm in a little bit of a different situation because usually by the time they get to me, we know they're high-risk anesthesia patients, we know they have horrendous dental disease, or you guys have already done a really great job of that. Um, so I think in general practice though, I think a lot depends on how your day works and how your day flows. Um, I think that if you can get a good awake oral exam um, and you know that Fluffy's nine years old, she's never had any dental care, and this is likely to be a long one. If you can plan for a longer procedure um, and plant the seed in the client's head that, hey, if we get fluffy under anesthesia, 
um, and there are a number of teeth that need to be extracted, we're going to be able to handle this today. But if we get fluffy under anesthesia, and once I get my dental x-rays, I find that we've now doubled the number of teeth that need to be extracted because they can't see below the gum line until I get my x-rays and can't get my x-rays till fluffy's asleep. If you prep that client for potential staging, um, I think that's a really great plan because you've given yourself a really good out. Your client's expectations are clear. You've you know, explain to them that two shorter anesthesias are much better than one longer anesthesia. So I think a lot depends on how, how things work in your practice, um, whether, you're jam whether you've got dental procedures in the morning that are gonna get you jammed up against appointments in the afternoon that, that aren't gonna be able to bend or flex. A lot depends on how you schedule. Um, but I think if you, if you expect things to be fairly routine, um, or you expect things to have one or two extractions, you can always, you know, present to the client that that's what we're going to do. Um, however, if we find things are more extensive, I'm going to let you know, you know, we're going to send you a text. We're going to, one of my technicians is going to give you a call and let you know that we're going to be staging things. Um, and if you set them up with those expectations, I think it goes over a whole lot better. If you do end up doing one and done and get everything done, you're a hero. And if you don't, you did what you told the client you were gonna do, you're gonna have a happy client because they knew what to expect. Just to verify, you use an envelope flap. Um, yeah, essentially that is almost an envelope flap that I tend to do, um, but I would say that um, it, if, if it's easier for you to do a releasing incision in front of the 09, um, you know, at the back of the 08, I would strongly recommend doing that if it gives you um, a better view. Um, do any of these fractured mandible, mandibular canines not abscess? So if you have a complicated crown fracture, so that means if you have a fracture and the pulp tissue is exposed, um, those are gonna abscess. Um, weeks, months, years, they're gonna end up with a two through abscess. When we see clients with complicated crown fractures, we tell them there are two options for those teeth. Um, one is to save the tooth. Um, and usually when I talk to clients about saving the teeth, I say, okay, Mrs. Smith, your dog has a complicated crown fracture of its left mandibular canine tooth, its lower left fang. Um, and what that means is that the pulp tissue is exposed, the inside of the tooth is exposed, food, bacteria, everything's gonna get down in there and eventually she's gonna have an infection at the tip of the root and it's gonna be really, really painful. Um, we have two choices for the tooth. One would be to save it. If we save the tooth, um, what, we're gonna, what we would need to do is send you to the dentist. They'll clean out the inside of the tooth, sterilize it, fill it, and then seal off that opening. And then I say, that's essentially root canal treatment. Because if you say, I can send you for root canal, the client's thinking, that's thousands of dollars. Is he crazy? Is she crazy? Why would I? I don't know if I did that for my kid. They're not going to listen to anything else you say. So we've got two options for this tooth. We can send you the dentist to save the tooth, um, or we can extract the tooth. And if the client says, well, do we have to do either of those? You say, yes, those are my recommendations. And if the client says, well, I just want to wait and watch, you can say, okay, it's not recommended. And you write in your medical record, advise root canal treatment or extraction, owner declined treatment. And then when the owner shows up at your practice on Christmas Eve or the day before Thanksgiving with the tooth root abscess, ugh, it always happens that way. But um, really only two options for those teeth. Um, how often do we recommend instrument sharpening? Ours currently never happen as no one on staff is trained. You send them out, the text sharpen them after each patient. Um, uh, Hugh Freedy, um, H-U-F-R-E-I-D-Y has really good um, instrument sharpening videos for staff. Um, so that's a really good one. Um, there's actually in the Journal of Veterinary Dentistry, there was a good instrument sharpening article. Um, our technicians do all of our sharpening. Um, that might be something that would be a really great um, once we get back to doing in-person thing you know, lab kind of thing to do um, for technicians. So that's something that we could consider doing. Um, I can also actually maybe talk to our technicians about putting together a, um, maybe a, a sharpening program for one of our spring or fall conferences. Um, so I would look for articles <clears throat> um, in terms of how often do they need to be sharpened. 
Um, they need to be checked each time they're being cleaned and wrapped. If they're dull, they need to be sharpened. Um, so learning how to check them and then learning how to sharpen them would be really important. Um, can canines with oronasal fistula potential ever be managed without extraction? Um, so if you have a canine tooth in place and there's communication into the nose, um, you're gonna get more and more stuff packed up in the inside of that tooth. You're gonna get food and bacteria and saliva up into the nose. You're gonna have chronic rhinitis. Um, if it's already gone into the nose, then no extraction is really the best option. If you have a tooth that's not truly an oral nasal fistula yet, and there's just a big pocket up the inside of that canine tooth, then you can certainly refer them for periodontal surgery, some guided tissue regeneration. Um, if you have a really dedica dedicated client that's willing to, to do that, um, and we can save that tooth. What is the needle used to pass the wire for wiring? Ah, it is called an 18 or 20 gauge needle. Um, it really is. I just use the same needle I draw blood with. Um, so depending on what size wire um, you have, usually an 18 or 20 gauge needle will do the job really well. Protocol that we use for nerve blocks. Um, we use a combination of bupivacaine and buprenorphine um, for our nerve blocks. Um, that's kind of a whole separate talk in itself, but if you have any specific questions, you're more than welcome to email me. Um, but we, we do a combination of buprenorphine, bupivacaine, um, in the same syringe. Um, and then we either do an infraorbital um, or a caudal maxillary on top. And then on the mandible, we do um, an inferior alveolar nerve block. Yep, so the um, oral hygiene rinse is made by Dermazoo. Um, so if you just uh, Google Dermazoo oral hygiene rinse, um, you should find it. Um, I think when I looked for the picture, uh, I even found it on Amazon and at Walmart, um, but we order it by the case. Um, I think we order it from Shine, um, I'm not sure. So yeah, Google that and if you can't find it, shoot me an email. Um, but it is Dermazoo. Am I comfortable using the rolling axle elevator technique we shared when one of the crowns is not being extracted, risk of crown trauma. Um, I think the risk of, of trauma to that other crown is really low um, because this is a really slow roll wheel and axle. Um, so you shouldn't get any movement of that tooth that's staying. Um, and so you really should, um, it, it, the picture sort of made it look like you go from sideways to rolled all the way the other direction, um, but it's not, it's sort of a, a slow roll, twist and hold, you give to the, the tooth that's leaving, um, we'll start to give, and then you can readjust, do another little roll, that tooth will start to give. If you're actually having to put so much force on it that you're you know, gonna risk damaging the other tooth, then you probably need to start doing some traditional elevating. Um, but you'd be, you'd be surprised, and I don't use it for I don't use it for the two buckle roots, those two long skinny roots. Um, it's just really useful for those big bulbous palatal roots. Um, is there a good video on where, how to do oral nerve blocks? Um, off the top of my head, um, Brett Beckman, who is a dentist out of Florida and Georgia, has lots and lots and lots of online videos and learning. Um, and he'd probably be the best one on oral nerve blocks. Um, also those book references that I gave you have some really good descriptions of oral nerve blocks too. Um, so that would, those would be, those would be good, good places to look. Um, we don't tend to use fluoride post dental cleaning. Um, I don't know that it, it really helps that much, but we don't tend to use oral fluoride post cleaning. <laughs> 